Hey everybody, welcome to this year's Summer Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase, where I walk through some of the cool services and tools out there in the Knowledge Graph space. I go through these with an honest review so that you can see what these are all about without necessarily having to go and talk to those salespeople, unless you really want to. All right, so the lineup for this year is really exciting. This is the graph technology we're talking about today. And make sure you stick around for this month's showcase because there are a lot of other cool tools that we will be reviewing. So with that said, let's go get and, started. Uh, I am actually co-founder of Top Quadrant. And I um, do product evangelism at Top Quadrant. Top Right Edge stands for Enterprise Data Governance. And um, here is um, kind of a bird's eye view of different capabilities of Top Right Edge. The packages can be used individually or they could be combined. Everything is uh, based on knowledge graphs. So that's our repository is a knowledge graph repository. And from that comes um, a lot of power being model driven even being based on ontologies or quote unquote semantic mm -hmm. models. So we have a built in knowledge graph repository that's actually optimized to support all these key features that we have. Is this a layer on top of a relational <coughs> database or are using graph database underneath? Um, using graph database underneath. Is it a proprietary one that you're using? And if somebody were interested in working with top braid, would they be able to use their own graph database if they had one? So it comes pre-built. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's already included with the product. So you don't mm -hmm. need to do anything about it. Now mm -hmm. it is RDF, so it's standards based. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore you could um, get data out in RDF. You could synchronize with an external RDF store if you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. Tabred Edge comes pre-built with some ontology models that we've created in order to support data governance use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, just to make it easier for people to get started. All right, so now we're going to go over to Jesse, who is going to show us how this looks in real life. This is Jesse Lambert. I'm a semantic solutions architect with Top Quadrant. SCOS is an ontology model that's being used right now, okay? So mm -hmm. Because I, I clicked on the United States and I've got the results over here. And as soon as you th see things like preferred label mm -hmm. and an alternative label, you're going to know that SCOS is already in there. And if I hover over preferred label, you'll see it is. It's SCOS pref label. Notice that United States isn't a concept. It's actually a country. Mm -hmm. And because it's a country and not just a SCOS concept, if I scroll down, I'll find some cool like geopolitical characteristics. Mm -hmm. It knows that, um, you know, that a country can have a capital. And the capital for the United States is Washington, D.C. And if you want the details about D.C., you can just expand it right there in line. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to hit the collections drop down, go to my ontologies and find the ontology. It's called top rate example geo ontology. And we're going to click on our country class. Notice mm -hmm. that this doesn't say United States or Canada or France here. This says mm -hmm. country. We're mm -hmm. in an ontology now. So this is the ontology that says that a country can have a capital right here in the middle, right? A country can have um, uh, country codes or whatever it is that you're wanting. And what I wanna do now is add a couple things like, hey, we want to have countries to have, let's go with something like a uh, ally relationship. And whenever a country has an ally relationship, that can only point to other countries and you can have unlimited so even the cardinality is just a simple pick list okay and nice. right right there i did like 80 percent of a modeler's job so not everyone is an expert in ontology on the channel so what do you mean by cardinality what does that do for you i'm going to create an attribute here and i'm going to say it's uh you know let's just go with my id and mm -hmm. i want it to be a string so it's going to be mm -hmm. a string value mm -hmm. and cardinality is one of those really important things that you want to be able to pick. Like, can I have unlimited number of my IDs or mm -hmm. should I have exactly one ally can only point uh, ally is a relationship that says countries can connect to other countries via this relationship. 
my ID is kind of like just an attribute, but we're understanding the cardinality of it. And we're actually understanding the shape of it. Mm -hmm. um, and now what I can do is go back over to my geography taxonomy. Now we've got inline um, what we call problems and suggestions reporting. Nice. Popping up for me automatically. So it's saying, hey, look, you're missing my ID. You have to have one of those. Edge can be configured to be strict or open. I like open because we're believers of, or at least I am a believer of any mm -hmm. metadata is good metadata, even if it's missing. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so this is actually kind of like meta data here mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're missing one of these things that you're supposed to have. Yeah. And if I scroll down here, I should be able to find ally. And if I try to find something like Pittsburgh, it's not going to show up because Pittsburgh's a city, mm -hmm. not a country. Mm -hmm. But if I try to search for Canada, I'm going to find it and I nice. can pick it, save my changes. And notice I have it configured for not being strict. So it mm -hmm. changed the button to save changes anyways, because we have that missing my ID I really input. like that option, and I don't remember seeing that in other tools that that are kind of in the same vein. So I absolutely love that you are really putting the full control in the customer's hands. You're you're guiding them, right? Like this is good data practice, yes. but we also know sometimes there's exceptions. <laughs> So the human right. user is being supported by the machine. And that's the whole idea of the semantic web in the first place. We're just really putting it in action. And this is what allows us to put models in place. Like I, Irene introduced the idea that we have hundreds of assets already modeled. And why this fairly large list of collections, if you're seeing mm -hmm. the drop down here, Ashley, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. many of these are already modeled for you. There's ontologies for representing things. The reason I came to this collection called employee records, and that was underneath the data asset collection, um, was to just show that you can use a knowledge graph to do things like data cataloging. Mm -hmm. So there's already mm -hmm. a rich ontology in place that understands that databases are made up of tables and tables are made up of columns and columns need to have data types and they should be mapped to glossary terms and they should have statuses and we want to be able to put stewardship into place and assign roles that's all modeled already out of the box for you powerful idea that you know a data element is a data element regardless of where it came from mm -hmm. so to be able to bring those things together and have um importers and a platform that is designed to add importers very easily um, to profile databases, to profile nice. DDL files, to automatically profile and extract this is great uh, data structure from spreadsheets and any random content really in general, but also the building blocks are there to consume JSONs and XMLs mm -hmm. as well. And it all comes together into a common model and therefore can be connected and extended, right? The models are there for you to extend and customize any of these asset types to make them jump or dance exactly mm -hmm. the way that you want them to. And then because of our open APIs, Sparkle, GraphQL, and REST, mm -hmm. uh, 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 REST like services, mm -hmm. um, we can move content in and out of top rate edge. It can be a part of the solution. It could be the end all be all. Mm -hmm. um, and it works, you know, because of that flexibility, we can get in there and solve problems that a lot, a lot of other systems struggle and with. And I'm, I'm very happy to see this because you're making it easy to use for the no code, low code and non graph person, which is so incredibly important to get better adoption for this sort of thing. Exactly. I, I went back to the geography example, um, but sometimes you need a relationship or a property, but you don't always know how the uh, value is supposed to be materialized. You don't want someone to manually have to populate everything. You're not going to get it from a yeah. spreadsheet or something like that. So we yeah. call them inferencing, right? They could be based mm -hmm. on any kind of calculation. They could be based on any kind of if-then logic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and because of the way that we have it implemented using Shackle, we're based on standards. Um, but the door is very wide open for us to be able to leverage and do quite advanced calculations. Um, and do it in real time. So it's not like a very heavy burdening reasoning okay. engine that you can't determine the scale and performance of. What we have is a real time shackle engine 
that is able to recognize what we call uh, value rules. So I could put in something like, you know, let's go back down to the country level and you see preferred labels are multilingual. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's nice to know how many of those do I have? Because you could have dozens of mm -hmm. um, alternative labels and preferred labels in all kinds of languages. Um, so it'd be nice to get a count of those without having to manually count them and without it being hard coded, because as soon as you add one, that that hard coded value is going to need to change. Mm -hmm. So inferring those values on the fly, um, what I can do is I can go over to, let's say we just want to count it at the country class again. So I can click on country. Um, let's go ahead and add another value and we'll just call it pref label count. And I'm not even going to populate anything because I'm going to infer the value here. So I'll just click OK. And then with preferred label count highlighted, um, I, I could go into source code. Um, so for us semantic web geeks that love RDF and the standards, um, it's great that I've got the source code editor available to me because it's what nice. we like to do sometimes. And this is also good for those that are starting to learn or want to understand, okay, I can do the drag and drop, drop low code option and then go into this and start to learn what this actually looks like in the data. Exactly. And I can do it the way I want to do it and learn how I want to learn. So I think this is actually a great learning uh, tool as well. It, it, it really is. And then in addition to that learning, what we've done is once we know some of the patterns, um, we can add them as templates. So you could have different templates available to you. These are the out of the box ones here. Mm. Um, and I'm going to just say, OK, preferred label count is a property of country. And what I want that property to be able to do is count a number of values that are at the end of the preferred label property. So I'm going to click OK here. And what Edge did for me was it populated that rule for me. So now whenever I show you the source code, what Edge did by choosing that template, it populated the shackle syntax for extending it with shackle rules. Uh, which is really pushing beyond the standard and taking Shackle mm -hmm. to the whole next level. So this little bit of syntax right here says uh, preferred label count. You will count the number of unique values at the end of the path known as SCOS preferred label. So whenever I switch over, well, actually, let's do one more thing here. Let's drag it up by the preferred label so that it's very context based. And now whenever I switch over to the geography taxonomy, we're looking at Mexico. I'll just refresh my screen here real quick. And preferred count six. If I click awesome. on the United States, that's it's going to say seven. And that's dynamically happening at query time right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and if we add a preferred label, it's going to automatically count. And the really cool thing here is if I go to the exports tab and go to something like the GraphQL endpoint. I'm horrible at GraphQL queries, but <laughs> because of the type ahead, it'll help me here. Nice. And if, if we say, hey, let's get all countries, I want their labels, um, I want their URIs, and I want their pref label count. The GraphQL schema got automatically updated as mm -hmm. soon as I edited the ontology. So now web developers who want to right. tap into something like a knowledge graph, they can use JSON, JSON mm -hmm. in, JSON out through mm -hmm. the GraphQL endpoint and automatically benefit from this ontology that's happening underneath the hood and even the cool things like the um, inferences. So if I pretty this up and run this query, Edge just automatically grabbed all kinds trees, their labels, their URIs, and those dynamically generated preferred label counts. And, and I, saw, it, I saw some in there that were looking at like one hop, two hops away. Yes. I love that. That's like one of the most common things I tell people, like, why do you want to see what does the knowledge graph do for you? Just do the one hop, two hop kind of analysis to understand like, oh, I didn't know those things were related. Like right there, you, 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 you communicate some of that value you get with a knowledge graph that you don't necessarily get with other technology solutions and you have a template for it, which is great. And what one thing that Top Quadrant has done and is proprietary, I guess you would say, is 
we've created um, what we call active data shapes. Uh, we call it ADS, mm. active data shapes. It's JavaScripting. Um, think of it as JavaScripting stored procedure kind of capability. So we can extend and customize edge, either buttons, drop down menus, reports, calculations, but we can also put a script at the end of that value. So if mm -hmm. you needed a, an extremely complex kind of inference, you've got an entire programming language exposed to you to base that nice. off of. So we've got very, very high end power, you know, power user capabilities there whenever it comes to how do you want these calculations to happen? What if mm -hmm. you needed if then or else kind of logic or looping logic or something? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we've done is we've exposed the JavaScripting tier to it um, and have that ADS library that automatically gets generated based on the ontologies that you have in the system. And Edge is going to give me a dedicated focused search application with facets on the left-hand side that are dynamically generated based on the kinds of results that you've got on the right. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got 224 results that match the keyword economy. And my favorite facet is the tight facet. And this will tell you, you know, that kind of like core thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. 213 of these are research papers. 10 of and them are five alludes, concepts. Yeah, that, that research paper alludes to the auto classification that this tool also does, right? Yes, let's just leave the tight facet open and change our economy keyword to something like employee. And now you'll notice my types have completely changed. I jumped into something that looks more like databases being profiled mm -hmm. and a data catalog and business terms being used to map as definitions to the different terms and stuff like that, to the different columns. So nice. just by changing my search, um, the facets have completely changed, um, but I can obviously jump right back to. You and know, where like, do those facets come from? Is that from the ontology? That's the ontology. So mm -hmm. the relationships are over on the left hand side, basically. So whenever mm -hmm. I did the keyword search on economy, there were less facets. Um, I did the keyword search on employee and it kind of blew up because my types, I've got a lot of different types. Mm -hmm. So my facets got more, you know, they're going to vary more. Yep. And this is, this is a good way of being able to just come here and say, okay, of my macroeconomics, oh, well, actually let's choose research papers and then let's get rid of our keyword search. So this is now showing 1,329 research papers. And if we were interested in macroeconomics, Mako tag, which is an auto classified relationship, um, looks like monetary policy is king. 166 things are tagged with monetary policy, while you know only um, 83 of them are tagged with interest rate. And segue into saying, you know, why are the semantic web standards so important? And that idea of inferencing that we introduced earlier. Um, auto classification is only one step towards really semantic data. Post-processing after auto classification, you could write a set of rules if you were a subject matter expert, you know, build your expertise into the model and you could do, you could put rules into place that says, you know, if inflation and monetary policy, then change the status of the document, make it important or send an email notification or, throw an alert, you know, something, you know, if, if this and that are in the same document, um, we need to, you know, we need to raise a flag. So is that primarily you do... how your auto classification works, is it mostly rule based? No, no, I was just mentioning that that's a like a, a secondary step. A oh, I see. I see. Right. I see. So mm -hmm. auto classifier is going to work like here. Let me let me click on one of these documents finally. That'll drill me into the collection that's hosting the this asset. Um, and it's highlighted for me on the left in the list. And mm -hmm. this is the full corpus of documents. And over on the right-hand side, I see the metadata. And that's where the macroeconomics tags that are relevant to this document will be in that, in that category. Um, and these were auto-classified. I didn't have to manually populate these. Mm -hmm. And the way that we manually, or the way that we, um, auto classify um, is to maintain the tagging, the, the connection between the document and the taxonomy term as governed tag sets themselves. 
So the tag set is a first class citizen in top right edge. So the tag sets will be like right here, um, content tag sets, so that you can rerun them. You could purge them. You could compare yesterday's version to today's version based on a taxonomy update or something like that. So to be able to govern those tags separately from the, the the given facts that are going to be in the other collections, like the corpora collection, the taxonomy collection, tag sets give you a good way to govern and approve and put into action the actual connections that are going between the taxonomies and the documents or between the documents and the taxonomy. So, so yeah, so could I process, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, I mean, the, the process is that uh, you could point up Red Edge to a content repository such as SharePoint or Adobe, you know, AM and or even your file drive. It will um, um, it will scan um, all the documents, getting their metadata, also getting their content for classification. And then you're going to say, OK, given this corpus and given this vocabulary, so that's my tag set. Uh, as an input, you'll give it a training set, which is a mm -hmm. small subset of documents that have been tagged with terms from that vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. And then it uses machine learning, taking into account uh, alternative names, taking into account relationships within taxonomy if exist, and then it recommends uh, the tags that are most relevant, right? And that's what we're seeing here on the screen, right? It's it's giving you like. Even though it doesn't say F score, it's it's really just a probability here. But you know, when you're doing machine learning, and I'm very happy to hear that it's not all rule based. Obviously, there's a time and a place for that. But you are doing true machine learning here, where you are doing here's your training set, here's your test set, which is very yeah. good to hear because that is the only way you can scale auto classification. So I'm very happy and, to see that. And it